Thank you for calling Death Before Desk Job. If you are this week's guest, please leave a message and Paul will call you back once he finishes the intro. Hey Paul, it's Sammy from Crystal Garden Creations. We still doing that interview, man? Call me back. Hey, this is Paul, and you're listening to Death Before Desk Job, the podcast geared towards creative people who are pursuing or who would like to be pursuing their creative endeavors to their heart's content. That catchphrase is becoming tiresome. It's so clunky, but it is what the show's about. That said, if you have any other suggestions for a new catchphrase, please send them my way. I'll totally give you credit. It's well earned. My guest this week is a little different than any of the other previous guests that I've had so far, because this is the first time I'm interviewing somebody that I didn't know. Uh, I know her now. Her name is Sammy LaRose. She has a shop called Crystal Garden Creations. She saw that I was sort of putting out feelers for guests, and she contacted me. Uh, We had a lovely conversation. And I learned something about crystal jewelry making that I didn't really understand. And I don't want to really get too deep into it before our conversation, because then you might not listen to it. But I do want to put my own ignorance on display a little bit. Um, Because another thing happened to me this week, and this is also a first because I'm going to editorialize a little bit. I was, all right, I was on YouTube and I got a suggestion for Taylor Swift's Tiny Desk Concert. Somewhere in this video between the first and second song, she made a remark about writing music and it stuck with me. If she was a guest on my show, it's exactly what I hope that she would say. So I'm going to play that clip for you. There's a song that I wrote on the album that I knew as soon as I wrote it, it was going to be the title track. Just, and it was like, writing songs is strange because it never happens exactly the same way. But sometimes it happens in a way that feels like this weird, like haunting that you can't really explain. Like you don't know where these ideas came from and you feel like you didn't work at all to write it, to write it, and that's the best. That's like the best kind of song. Um, and then there are most days you show up and the idea doesn't, and that's where craft. You have to kind of know the craft of it, and you have to try to like scrounge your brain for something to write because you're not always going to be inspired, and that's okay. Um, there's a really good Elizabeth Gilbert TED talk about that. That is like <laughs> one of my favorite things to like cry while watching um all right i guess i'm a swifty now she pretty much spoke directly to me in that and it reminds me very much of something that uh josh homie from queens of the stone age had said which is a comparison i thought i'd never draw by the way but he said something years ago about songwriting and i couldn't remember the quote and i couldn't find a video of it but i Googled it, and I eventually found, I think, what I was remembering. Contextually, he's talking about songwriting, and he refers to it as chasing. And when the interviewer says, what do you mean by that? He says, a song like Go With The Flow came to me all lyrics, all music, all drums at once. I could hear the entirety of it. You don't always get that luxury, so you're trying to chase down a feeling. I try to make it so that songs... Leave me with that feeling. Like when you leave a first date with somebody and you get those butterflies. Those are the feelings I'm trying to chase with music. I want every song to give me that feeling. Once you reach that, it immediately goes away and you're forced to chase it down again. That's the bittersweet curse of music. It's a lot like beach sand on your hand. It doesn't last for long. I really thought that was an absolutely fantastic pull quote. And I think it sums it up beautifully. Back to Taylor Swift. She brings up the TED Talk with Elizabeth Gilbert, and she is the author of Eat, Pray, Love, which I did not know. Again, my own ignorance on display for the third time within the first few minutes of this podcast, by the way. I pulled a clip from that TED Talk, and I think it's specifically what was referenced 
in the first clip. Um, I had this encounter recently where I met the extraordinary American poet Ruth Stone, who's now in her 90s, but she's been a poet her entire life. And she told me that when she was growing up in rural Virginia, she would be out working in the fields and she said she would like feel and hear a poem coming at her from over the landscape. And she said it was like a thunderous train of air and it would come barreling down at her over the landscape. And when she felt it coming, because it would like shake the earth under her feet, she knew that she had only one thing to do at that point point, and that was to, in her words, run like hell, and she would like run like hell to the house, and she'd be getting chased by this poem, and the whole deal was that she had to get to a piece of paper and a pencil fast enough so that when it thundered through her, she could collect it and, um, and grab it on the page, and other times, she wouldn't be fast enough, so she'd be like running and running and running, and the, she wouldn't get to the house, and the poem would like barrel through her, and she would miss it, and she said it would continue on across the landscape looking, as she put it, for another poet. And, um, and then there were these times, this is the piece I never forgot. She said that there were moments when she would almost miss it, right? So she's like running into the house and she's looking for the paper and the poem passes through her and she grabs a pencil just as it's going through her. And then she said it was like she would reach out with her other hand and she would catch it. She would catch the poem by its tail and she would pull it backwards into her body as she was transcribing on the page. And in these instances, the poem would come up on the page perfect and intact, but backwards from the last word to the first. <laughs> so when I heard that, I was like, that's, un you know, that's uncanny. That's exactly what my creative process is like. <laughs> so why am I sharing all of this with you? I just feel that it's important to talk about craft and inspiration. It also forced me to assess, again, my own ignorance and finding something inspiring in the least expected place. Do with this information what you wish. Hopefully it moved you in the way it moved me. I do want to get to my interview with Sammy LaRose of Crystal Garden Creations. You can find her on Instagram at crystal underscore garden underscore creations or Etsy, etsy.com slash shop slash crystal garden C. That's the letter C, crystal garden C. And you can get all the show notes, links to the aforementioned clips, as well as all of Sammy's links at deathbeforedeskjob.net. Click on Sammy's episode on the homepage, and it'll bring you right to the show notes for this episode. As I mentioned earlier, she contacted me. She was bold, and I think that should be rewarded. Let that be a lesson to you this week, too. Don't tell yourself you can't. Just reach out. The worst you're going to get is no. And uh, I'm glad I didn't say no, because it would have been my loss. Here is my conversation with the Crystal Fairy herself. Sammy LaRose. Hey, Sammy, how's it going? Hey, Paul, it's going good. How are you? I'm hanging in. I'm locked down. You're uh, you're locking down out of town, right? Yeah, uh, I'm in Calicoon Center currently. It's really nice up there. Yeah, um, there's a lot of good birds up here. I'm really into bird watching, so... I'm in a happy place right now. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm very jealous. Uh, and it sounds like a lovely time. It sounds like a really good space to kind of like clear your head. Have you been doing any good creative thinking up there? Uh, I've been like brainstorming, but I actually haven't really made any art. But the quiet has allowed me to get some like good ideas down. Right. It's a huge part of the process. So I'm not like, you know, there's no knocking brainstorming here. When it comes to your process and how you go from the uh, brainstorming aspect of what you do to the finished product, maybe you can enlighten people as to what the process looks like for a maker like yourself. For a while, I tried to kind of like get into this groove of like, okay, I'm going to make art right now and do it. And then I kind of realized that I didn't really make the best art when I kind of like made myself make it. So now it's kind of more like I'll be doing something. And if I get like this, like feeling of creativity, I just stop what I'm doing and go for it. And it's funny. I feel like a lot of artists work at a desk, but I actually 
make my art sitting on my bed because it's where like the best light in my room is. Okay, so that that sounds almost counterintuitive to some advice I've heard. Some people tell you like you need to keep your bed and your workspace separate, but you find it better to actually work within your bed. Yeah, I do like all of my stuff for my business on my bed. I think the only time I'm in the part of my room that has all my art stuff is when I'm making coils because I can't attach the coil machine to my bed. (laughs) What is the coil machine and what does the coil machine do for uh, your jewelry? How does that work? So the bottom has like a clamp that you kind of twist down onto like a table or some kind of like, say like window seal kind of surface. And then there's a, you can, there's different gauge sizes for like the, um, I guess you could call it, it's like a hand crank. So like there's different gauge sizes that you can put through these little holes. And then you, there's a loop on it that for me, I just, I put the wire in the loop and kind of secure it in there. And then you just crank it until like with your hand until you have like the desired length take it off and then do it again and how long does this process take from beginning to end um i think each coil takes about like two minutes to make oh, okay so it's not that bad but usually my process is i'll i'll wrap all of my crystals in one day and then i'll do all the coils on a separate day and then i'll put them together on a different day I see. So you sort of just focus on one step per day and just do it, just get into that uh, assembly line mode for yourself. Yeah, I've found it like a lot easier and less time consuming, like by breaking it up like that. Sure. Yeah. Once you get into a rhythm, it's, you know, it's things fly. So if that's keeping you efficient, then go for it. That's awesome. Um. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I want people to understand why I wanted to talk to you. I think that there is this misconception about how much creativity is truly involved in doing the kind of thing that you do. I think some people might perceive it as more of an assembly line practice. And I use that word just now, and I didn't mean it in a derogatory way. I meant it in terms of efficiency, but there is a lot of creativity and there's a lot of art and nurture that goes into what you do. So to somebody who doesn't understand, uh, maybe you could point to um, some examples of how your creative brain has to get uh, involved in this process to have a better result. Yeah, usually for me, like I, I always need music on, like music or a podcast, but mainly music when I make art. Otherwise, I just can't get into the right headspace. So I'll usually put on like some kind of lo-fi beat music that I can kind of zone out to and let my mind just go into the creative process. And then I'll take whatever crystals I already have, or if I have larger pieces of crystals, I'll actually put on goggles and um break up the large pieces of crystals with a few different types of hammers i have and then from there just kind of wrap them like when i break them up i never know what kind of shape they're going to turn out like so it's kind of like this cool like oh okay so if i hit it really hard depending on the crystal that's going to disintegrate so i have to do it with like this right precision where it's not going to disintegrate or explode in my face, but still be like large enough to be able to be a pendant. Right. So there's this like technical skill aspect involved too. I think one of the things I didn't even see or understand is that, that there's actually this physical craft that has to go into making these into manageable pieces that look good because I assumed they were just that way. They always just came that way. How do these crystals arrive to you? Like, how do you, when you get them, what are you generally looking at? Um, so sometimes I get wholesale from Colorado. And fortunately for me, my I've been using that supplier for a long time. So he'll ask me when I order, he'll say like wrappable. So he'll actually go through his inventory and look for crystals that are more likely to be easy for me to wire wrap. But a lot of times if I order wholesale on Etsy, I'm getting completely raw stone. So 
when they come to me, they actually are still covered in the, the dust from mining. So I have to wash them off in like a pasta strainer and then actually sit them in a bowl with mineral oil and let them soak overnight because um, a lot of times you can't see the true color yet because the dust is so ingrained in the crystal that without using the mineral oil, a lot of times it makes the color look off. I'll let it sit for like a day or two until the crystal can like fully absorb the oil. And then after that, like give them a rinse. And if they're the desirable size, leave them. But if not, then I have to break them up. I see. So there is a lot more to this than I think meets the eye for some people. And I, I, I'm, I'm curious how you found your way into this, into this field. It seems like there's so much to this process uh, that you must love the process. What brought you here? Um, I started wire wrapping, I want to say in like 2014-ish. I had recently lost my best friend and had gotten into meditation from there. And every time I went to this crystal shop, they always like to meditate. They always kind of interacted uh, or yeah, interacted like with crystals with us. And I don't know if it was like a placebo effect or for me, like I'm a very spiritual person now. So I felt like they were working. And then from there, I just really got into like, oh, like, what can these do for me? And looked into it. And I, um, I started to really like the jewelry aspect. Like I wanted to wear more crystals, but it was just so expensive that I kind of just had thought like, well, you know, what if I just make them like, I'm sure I could make them. So you found them to be soothing. Yes, definitely. I'm sorry for your loss. I also uh, lost a best friend of mine um, when I was probably in the same age range. Uh, and there, it's this strange double-edged sword. I don't know if you experience it the same way, where there is a lot of potential for growth in those terrible moments and i don't know do you feel the same way as i do definitely i always think like when i really sit there and think about where my business started i always think like wow like his loss almost gave me life because at the time um i had been like i think a few months sober and didn't really know what my life could have turned into at that point and then after it happened it was kind of like this wake-up call of like, okay, I need to do something with my life. And I feel like maybe if things hadn't happened, I wouldn't really know where I would have ended up. Did you have uh, any trajectory of any kind that was happening before you got into this line of work uh, that maybe didn't pan out or maybe you weren't crazy about? I went to school, I think for like a semester or two for creative writing. But the funny thing about going to school for creative writing is I kind of feel like it hinders your creativity because a lot of times you have to go to school for so long before you can actually start writing about the things you want to write about. And my English teacher and I would always just like disagree on everything. Like I felt like I was just writing essays to prove him wrong and it just made me just not want to go to school for it anymore or even write for a really long time. I can see both sides of that, though. I can definitely see, like, the, the the side of it that the professor pushes, too, where the professor says, well, you need to, you know, learn how to do this before you can do this. But at the same time, if you're inhibiting a passionate soul from creating what they want to create, you're potentially uh, preventing new content from emerging, and, and that seems dangerous. Yeah, definitely. If you were to try your hand at creative writing do you know what kind of content might come out of that um well i went to school mainly for poetry and a few years ago i just started writing again i think the funny thing about writing is you never pick when to write it's just kind of like you're out doing something and all of a sudden like at least with poetry like all these words come into your head and like in that second you have to get them down so you don't forget them so I started keeping like a little black book on me. That way, any time that happened, I could just like write these really little short poems. Has there been crossover there? Has 
having that writing experience given you any sort of leg up when it comes to say marketing your products in like an online forum where people can't speak to you face to face and they have to read a description? I think so. Like I think on my Etsy shop, I try like pretty hard to get the description in a way where it flows nicely and it's not overwhelming. Because I know as being someone who shops a lot online, sometimes you read something and you're like, ah, that that's too long or like that's too overwhelming. So it's kind of given me like this upper edge of knowing like the balance between that. How does that work for you in terms of what kind of language you use? Is is it generally very um, sales heavy? Is it more product focused? I mean, there's different approaches to how you would write something like that. I think more like product like approach. I try to give the crystal as much attention as I can. For those who are like into the spiritual aspect of it, I try to put you know the properties that maybe someone would be looking for on the post, and then. If anyone ever has any questions, you know, I always answer, like, whether it's an Etsy DM or an Instagram one. Is that where you do most of your online sales, through um, social and uh, Etsy? Yeah, and in person, too. Recently, I've been doing a lot of sales in my stories, just because I feel that that's kind of where I get, like, the most engagement, is when I do a lot of, like, story sales on Instagram versus on Etsy. When it comes to monitoring engagement, do you use any sort of like external tools to do that? Or is that just purely based on data that you kind of collect from, you know, just seeing what happens? Um, It's mainly from just seeing what happens. Like every now and then I'll check the Instagram insights, but I actually try really hard not to. That way it doesn't really get in my head. But I kind of just like see the patterns maybe in my posts like what people pay attention to most or like what they're interested in more like I've noticed a lot of times people like when I have like time-lapse videos of me working on something I've had some luck with time-lapse when it comes to illustration too I think people really do take a great appreciation in seeing something come into existence yeah I think so too because it kind of gives them like a window into your world. And it does bring this other element too of not of you're not just buying something that was made by some machine. You're watching something being made with love. And what sounds like what you do is definitely a a product of love. Yes, definitely. I think in like posting or anything I do with my business, I try to be as personal as possible to let people know like hey, like, I'm not a machine. I'm a one-person shop, and, like, I care about what you're getting. I I got that sense right away just from engaging with you, and I, I did want to say, you know, you brought up the spiritual aspect of the products, and I tend to gravitate a little bit more into the skeptic realm. Uh, I'm not... My, my personal attitude is... Could be. You know, I, that's my personal way of, of of perceiving things. So, now, do you specifically gear your products towards people who are searching for those properties, or or do you have any luck with crossover? Um, I think I've had a really good amount of crossover. I've noticed because I have people that get things from me, whether it be my shop or like commissions. I've noticed with my commissions people don't ask me for a specific stone. They more tell me what's going on in their life and ask me what they think, like what stone would help them with that. I think that's about 90% of my commissions is people kind of opening up to me almost like I'm a little therapist. That's wild. What is that experience like? Um, It's really interesting because as a kid, I always wanted to be a therapist, but like didn't think I could maybe handle the full amount of what they do in therapy. So it's kind of like this nice little balance of like people confiding in me things that are nice, like not always nice, but just being able to hold that space for them, especially after I finish a commission and send it out. I've always gotten back like really, really heartfelt messages that I'm just like, oh, this is why I do what I do. Is that a, is that something you saw going into this or is that some sort of unforeseen side effect of what you started doing 
I feel like it was an unforeseen side effect because going into this, I kind of just made stuff for myself and then people noticed it and were like, you should do something with this. And I was kind of like, you know, I'm 18. I'm not going to school. Why not? Like, let's just kind of see where this goes. Sure. And it seems like it's been working out for you. Your shop, Crystal Garden Creations, uh, has definitely logged its fair share of sales online and you have your Instagram following and you have engagement through that avenue but you also do stuff in person too yes and i feel like the the question that anyone who is looking into making a living or maybe not even making a living just building a a small little side business out of their passions i think there's this belief that if you have an instagram account and maybe you put up an etsy shop that you're all set and I think anyone who does this professionally will tell you it's a lot more than just setting up a storefront and saying you're a business on social media. I think it's a matter of getting out there and interacting and engaging with people in person. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience with trying to find a balance between doing these uh, face-to-face events and then building an online entity for yourself. I get a lot more sales in person, definitely, than online. I'm not really sure why. I think from, like, I guess, a spiritual aspect, people that are really into crystals would rather see them in person because then they could feel if they have a connection to them. So I think with that, that's where a lot of, like, my in-person sales come in. But I also think from, like, a networking perspective that it was really important for me to do things in person so people could kind of be like, oh, like, you're, you're a real person, you know? Not just like an online store. I could see that being a huge part of it. When doing these things in person, are you usually invited to do them? Um, Or is it the kind of thing you have to go out and hunt for these opportunities? And if so, how do you do that? Um, I feel like 80% of the time it's people asking me. Like this year, I actually had a really cool opportunity. I did this uh, art show called Raw Artist. Um, they're like an artist collective that are based like in New York and all other places. And they actually reached out to me via email to have me one of their shows. And then after like a month after they reached out to me, I had a few other places in the city also reach out to me to like do more vending in the city, which is definitely interesting because I think with the city vending, a lot of times like you either have to like pay or sell tickets, which can be stressful. But the outcome is so worth it. Like, I think for the Raw Artist Show, I made over $700 in, like, a like six-hour show, maybe. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't expect to make that much at all. And it was, like, the whole night, my table was, like, packed. And it was such, like, this really good, surreal feeling where I was, like, wow, is this what being an artist feels like? Like, I want to feel like this all the time. Like, it was so great. It's really nice when feeling like uh, being an artist can have a direct correlation to uh, financial gain, for sure. But I, I'm sure it's, I, I I don't know, has it always been such a, a positive uh, response to what you do? Has it always been, uh, or has there been hard goings? I think it's always been pretty positive. I think the the hardest like choice I had to make was my business used to be called um and I had a business partner who actually stole my first business from me and after that happened I had to kind of make this decision of okay am I going to give up or am I going to start over so I just started Crystal Garden Creations and kind of like rose that up by myself from the ground up I'm I'm mortified that that happened to you and i'm sorry that it did is there i mean we don't have to go on about that story in particular if you don't want to but um was there an error in your judgment regarding how you handled yourself and are there things you do now to prevent yourself from running into the same type of conflict with somebody else um i think maybe in the beginning i was just really naive like me and this person have the passwords for everything And since I did a lot of the work, like maybe in the future, if I ever did have someone work for me again, it'd kind of be like, okay, like 
you don't you definitely don't get any of the passwords at least for like the things that maybe you could just take from me sure yeah that, that's important to protect yourself in that department data is so sensitive and, and uh, i i'm i, I I'm sorry that this happened to you. Is is this person still operating under your old name? They are, but I've kind of come to this point in like my journey where like I've forgiven them and they actually kind of indirectly reached out to me. Um, I ran into their cousin one time at a bar and their cousin was like, yo, like, I'm so sorry they did that to you. Like, I love them because they're my family, but I don't agree with what they did. And then I ran into them like a week later at the bar and they had told me that this person told them to apologize for what they did, like told their cousin to let me know they were sorry. And at that point in my life, I was already like over it and had forgiven them for myself. But it was kind of this nice feeling of like, okay, this chapter is like closed now, like water under the bridge. I'm glad you were able to get at least that, I think you deserved a lot more than that, but that's more than some people ever get. Uh, and the reason I asked if they're still in business, because after hearing this, I'm going to make sure I bleep your old name so nobody goes and looks them up, because I don't want them getting money off of your misfortune. Yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Look, it, 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 it peeves me. Uh, I, I mean, I've been stolen from, I've been plagiarized. A lot of these things have happened, and usually... I can shrug it off and know that I'm going to move on to the next thing. So whatever. Um, but I've, I've never had my business stolen. Uh, that that's, that's mind blowing. I, I don't think I, I don't know if I'd be as resilient as you are. I'm glad you're at the point in your, in your life adventure where you can kind of see past all that. Yeah. It was definitely like one of those moments where it was like, a hard thing like okay what am I gonna do now but um it was funny I had actually just been given this crystal book from someone I knew like around that time and I opened it and this card fell out of it and it was an old store in the city called Crystal Garden and I was like I was so freaked out I was like well if that's not a sign I don't really know what is <laughs> <laughs> That's does it, it? It didn't exist uh, at the time when you were starting it up. It was an old defunct business. Yeah, it was like a business from like the eighties, nineties. There was a crystal shop in the city, and I was like, "Wow, this is really weird." <laughs> I hope you saved that. That sounds awesome. I I have it in my wallet actually, <laughs> as like a kind of constant reminder if I'm ever feeling down to be like. No, there, there's something here. Something said to keep going. <laughs> that's that's very surreal. I, I don't I don't know if I've ever experienced anything quite like that before. I mean, usually when I see somebody who has, you know, the same name or is operating under a similar thing, or if I see the same thing, I usually get very discouraged. Uh, and it sounds like in your case, it, it it couldn't be discouraging because it's it's defunct. It no longer exists. So you're you're in the clear. It sounds like that's awesome. Um, I know when we spoke previously before we did the interview, you did mention that you ran into another, um, another, I'm not going to say plagiarism, or maybe I can say plagiarism. I don't know how you would refer to it in the world of stones, but you had an issue with somebody trying to pass themselves off as you. Yes. Um, I had this girl by like a very large amount of pendants from me. That's and it's kind of uncommon for people to do that. Like, I think max, usually people get three pendants and it's around the holidays when they're like, okay, like, this is like mom, sister, girlfriend. But she had gotten, I don't know, like 10 stones from me all at full price. And then someone had let me know that she had started a website or was selling them on Instagram, like as her wrapping them. Christ. So uh, here's my question regarding that. Uh, what action did you take following that, if any? Um, I confronted her. I think looking back now, I definitely could have maybe not been as mean. But at the time, I was a lot younger and was really pissed because I had just started my new business. And then someone, you know, had tried to do that already after experiencing my first business get stolen. So I was just kind of like, no, this is not happening again. 
Sure. Uh, it seems like you learned your lesson, obviously, after the first time somebody took from you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry it happened again. But I, I, I bring it up because just to, to, to see that happen, I, I don't know. Looking back, what is your interpretation of that? Like, does, I don't know. I feel like some people could be defeated, but you persist. Why is that? I don't know. I've always kind of had that attitude my whole life. Like, I was kind of like the outcasted kid growing up. So I just learned how to have some really tough skin. So anytime anyone's tried to put me down in my head, I'm kind of like, oh, no, you want to put me down? Like, I'm going to rise even higher just to, like, not spite you, but just, you know, not let you get to me. Good. I'm very glad to hear that. Just hearing the story of that my first thought reminded me of something that happened to me uh, where a client that I work with was basically getting ripped off. It was work that I had done for them and they saw that somebody took it and replicated it and they were pissed and I can't blame them. In a way I was too, but they were, the thing that kind of went through my head at that time was I really don't know what I could do about it because it's not like I was legally protected uh, in that capacity. Uh, and it sort of told me that I was, I must have been doing something right because somebody felt that it was decent enough to want to pass off as their own. And that was the only thing that kind of gave me any assurance, but it's, it doesn't make it right. And I, I, I'm jealous that you have the ability to confront that person because I'm too much of a chicken. I can't do it. <laughs> I think, you know, people just handle things differently. I think at that point in my life, it would, it happens so close to getting, my first business stolen that at the time I was just like on like my last like hair standing. So I think I was just like, no, this is not happening. Like, but I think I've also just, that's just the kind of person I am. I'm very like honest, call you out on, you know, your bullshit. If there's bullshit kind of person. Right. I'm like that, that honest friend that when you go shopping and you're like, do I look fat in this? I'll just be like, yeah. Try something else on. <laughs> that's 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 rare quality. Criticism is often requested and never appreciated. Oh yeah. Especially as an artist. I feel like sometimes a lot of artists get offended by criticism when it's never meant to be mean. You're just, you know, someone asks, you say, Well, you know, I think this doesn't look like that if you're trying to get it to look like that. Well, there's a way to give criticism in a constructive way that's not vicious some people are just yes. vicious and they want to bring you down because they're they're jealous or they just want to see you fail so that they might have a chance and then there are people who were willing to listen i know what you're trying to do and i'm just telling you as your friend if you're trying to do that it's not working and i think that there's a there's a there's a way to do it in a healthy way where you can encourage the person to continue um, it's, and you strike me as that person thank you it's it's a it is a great compliment. I mean it sincerely. So I appreciate uh, it. So um I did want to say, despite all of these challenges that you've come across, because it sounds like there have been many from just the short time talking to you, you have managed to persist and make this into more or less a, a substantial chunk of your income. Um, I know that you had said to me previously on the phone that, you know, there are, year, there are years where you can only do this and there are years where maybe you have to take something, but this does help you substantially. So if you could like play that out, perhaps on a timeline of like when you started to see an uptick from when you started to where you are now. And perhaps what steps somebody who wants to get into making what they can really expect. I think there's the misconception of I could start an Etsy store tomorrow and I've got a business. And I, and I know that's not true. 
So maybe you can kind of talk about your experience in like a realistic timeline type of way. Yeah. Um, I think for any business, if you're really going to start it, it's a minimum of like five years of hard work before you really seeing, start seeing like really good things. Like, was I making a decent amount of money uh, like three to four years in? Yeah, but I noticed that the most growth and like sales and exposure I got was after I hit like that five year mark. Things just like changed. Because at that point, you put so much work into things that you finally start seeing, like, the ball rolling. Whether it's, like, people contacting you for commissions or to do shows or, you know, you're seeing the numbers increase. But I definitely think a lot of people think that it's, like, a one and done. Like, I made an Etsy shop online. Like, I'll have a bankroll soon. It's just, it's so much harder than that. There's so much work that you have to put into it that I think people don't see behind the camera. Of course. When it came to moving to an online platform, was Etsy the only one? Was Etsy the first one? Um, what what does how what was that journey like? Just exploring into the e-commerce world. I think the first one they ever used was Spreezy, which I I don't even know if it's a, a web store anymore. I think my business partner or I had found it in like an advertisement. And it was really great. Like um they had a very user-friendly platform on both sides. Like sometimes I feel like these e-commerce sites, it's like easy for customer, not easy for you or like vice versa. But this was like very easy both sides, like for you, for them. I think when my first business partner had left is when I decided to do it in Etsy because before I started making crystals, I tried to sell plants online and realized that they're really heavy to ship. (laughs) So I was like, uh, maybe not gonna do that. But at that point, I already had had an Etsy, and like right. I gotten used to the platform. So you just kind of wrote it out because you were familiar with the platform, and I'm guessing that, you know, why waste time learning a new thing if I don't need to, and I'm familiar with how to work this. Yeah, definitely. Have you considered migrating to any other platforms? Um, I've been considering uh, making my own website, either using. Uh, Vistaprint or Wix or even Square. I'm trying to find the one that's maybe more friendly for customers to understand since like, you know, the biggest part of online selling is making sure the people that are buying it like get the website. Like I hate nothing more than when I go online to buy something and the website is like so confusing that I'm like, I don't even know where I can buy what I'm looking for. It's a big oversight. You have a lot of builders out there and a lot of people make the website that they want to make to project a certain image of their business, but they overlook the UI. They overlook the user's uh, experience. Yeah, definitely. That's why I've kind of been looking into like something that maybe I could do myself. I mean, say what you want about Etsy, but at least they've built a, a functional high-powered search engine that people can easily buy something on and they made it easy enough for the sellers where you can easily get your products online and as long as you're playing by the rules and you know keeping up to date on everything there's boundless potential on that platform yeah i love etsy i am you know i use it as a seller but i use it as a buyer all the time like if i need something like the first place I'll usually look, I have a, a box at my house that's filled with every local business card I've ever been given. So a lot of times if I need something, I'll look through that box first to see if someone locally can do it. And then if not, I'll go on Etsy. That is really smart. I think people talk a big game about supporting local businesses or crafters and uh, independents. But I think the second the going gets tough and trying to find it, People will just say, you know, forget it. I'm going on Amazon. I'm going on Target. Yeah, all the time. And I also see it from the perspective of, like, I put so much, like, time and effort and money into my business cards. I'd never want someone to throw mine out. So I never throw anyone else's out kind of on that premise. That's a a karma thing. I like that. Oh, I never really thought of it that way. But, yeah, it really is. Well, I'm hoping that your card has ended up in at least one uh, shoebox that gets sourced every 
once in a while. <laughs> Me too. I know that one of the things you brought up on the phone, and this is sort of backtracking a little bit, but I just looked at my notes. I know that you brought up your coil machine and, and the wrap and how you did it um, on your bed. Now, you also mentioned to me in the, in the, I'll call it the screening, that you, the way you wrapped your crystals ended up becoming something of a signature mark for you, which to me is sort of alien because I did not even understand the full depths of the the crystal jewelry world. Yeah, um, I was trying to coil funny because until like this or last year i really didn't know that people recognized me by it because when i first started doing it i did it as a way so that no one could see the sloppy part of my wrapping when i was getting used to wrapping so i kind of find it ironic that something i did as a way to hide maybe not the best parts of my wrapping became my signature trait and now like now i've gotten a lot better at wrapping so like i don't have that like little sloppiness anymore but I've gotten so used to just like making the coils and like the way that they look that I just kind of kept doing it. What, um, if, if anything, did you take from that? Um, at first I thought it was like really funny in like a cool way. Like, oh my God, like the thing I used to hide a human error became my signature. And like, I got a good laugh out of it. Cause like, I'm a very silly person. So a lot of things, everything makes me laugh. And then I kind of just thought, like, it's kind of cool that people have come up to me or, like, have come up to people wearing my necklaces and knew that it was, like, Crystal Garden Creations. Like, I have a lot of friends that wear my pendants and are like, oh, someone recognized your pendant today because of the coil on it. Is that what people call you or recognize you as Crystal Garden Creations or do they ever go by, oh, Sammy do they know it's Sammy how does that play out um I think both I also get a lot that people think my name is Crystal which I find really really funny <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little on like, the nose yeah yeah people are like oh hi Crystal and I'm like eh, that's not my name but that, that's really funny I'm, I'm sometimes I just go with it I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad name and I would also say it's pretty amazing that you get recognized and called the thing you are trying to actively make your living that's pretty interesting at least they're making the association yeah that's how i feel too because on my facebook like it's my name but then in quotes it says the crystal girl mm -hmm. and i think a lot of times people just read it and they're like oh her name must be crystal which i also think is it's just funny to me like it cracks me up that's pretty wild there's a there's a couple of steps in making all of this that I feel can become a little intimidating. And one of them in particular is wholesaling. I think the world of wholesaling can be a little uh, frightening to somebody who's never delved into it, but it seems that you actually have to do this on a semi-regular basis in order to manage your inventory. Uh, what can somebody expect when they enter this world? And is it, um, is there a barrier for entry or is it something that you kind of caught on too quickly? Um, I think with wholesale, it all depends on, like, what you're selling, because I think the biggest thing that's intimidating for wholesale for a lot of people is for certain wholesale, you need a tax ID, and for other wholesale, you can just find online, like, on a platform like Etsy or another shop. I probably think that's the most intimidating thing for people is, like, oh, I want a business, but, like, I don't have a tax ID. What do I do? Especially when, you know, when you're first starting out, you don't get a tax ID right away because you don't know what's going to happen. I know that the process is, when it comes to tax ID and registering, it's not explicitly difficult. I know that it's a fairly simple thing to do, that if you want to get yourself registered with your county, you just got to go down to the clerk one day, fill out a paperwork. I think you, in, in my county, it was like $40. And, you know, by lunchtime, I had a business and a tax ID and you know, I think you have to fill out some online form, but that's that's cake. Um, but I mean, after that, um, is it just as easy as shopping anywhere else? I think so. I mean, I feel like, well, for me with the crystals, um, 
it really depends. Like, I try not to get anything from China because a lot of crystals that come from China end up being fake or they're man-made. So I'm definitely wary of that when I am buying things. Like, I like to make sure where they're coming from is, like, a good place or, like, you know, they're ethically sourced because I think a lot of people don't think about the people actually mining the crystals and how they're treated. So when I buy things, I kind of try to take everything like that into account, which is actually why, like, I personally try my hardest to never use Amazon for anything. When it comes to sourcing your materials for your products or in general in life? Uh, both, honestly. Like, I think the only relation I have with Amazon is... I shop at Whole Foods sometimes because I'm vegan, but when they first bought out Whole Foods, I was very sad (laughs) because I was like, ah, I don't want to support Amazon, and now I'm going to end up doing it. (laughs) Like, They got their mitts and everything, you know? It's one of those. (laughs) Oh, man. yeah, I I envy you. I wish I had that restraint, especially during this, you know, coronavirus, and it's like I can't leave the house. They're open. I'm not as morally strong as you i'm i'm i envy it uh and i suppose it's something i could be more diligent about but uh i commend that it's and i'm is that part of your business the ethical concerns is that something that you really showcase when you're selling or is that just something that's private to you um i think it's something that's private for me because like It's just something I've been doing ever since I became vegan. Like, I used to have this app on my phone that, um, it was like this app that you put the things that you supported in, and you could scan a PLU or, like, you know, the barcode, and if the company you're buying from didn't support any of the things that you supported, it would actually tell you so that you would know whether or not these companies were for or against the things that you supported so that you could decide based on that if you still wanted to buy it or not. Wow, that's amazing. It was a really cool app. I like wish I still had it on my phone because it was so long ago and I've gone through so many phones since then <laughs> right. that I, I can't remember what it was. But I think just from doing that for a long time, it made me more conscious to things I was buying, like putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah, really voting with your dollars. That's super cool i did not know about that i uh when i was in college i had a portfolio piece that i tried to design that was based around that idea um where it would be like a catalog that you could shop through and it would have a little icon system that would indicate uh which products aligned with which value system so if you were worried about uh, gluten if you're worried about like fair trade if you were worried about this and i i realized i could not possibly make an entire catalog by myself so i think it, i think i just designed like a one-page spread for a sample but yeah i really admire that as a part of your business practice and i mean just from a sales point of view i'd almost say like you should really push that a little harder if, if you're not already because that's i think that's something that people really do care about and if you're voting with your money like that i'm sure there are others yeah that's very true there there's a lot of people that i follow back or like that follow me that like just from the things they post on their stories i can tell that they do the same thing you know like voting with their money and to maybe tie this off i would ask why should anyone here vote for crystal garden creations with their money (laughs) um i think they should just on the aspect that it's a small and local business and that when you buy something from me you're not you know buying something from a factory you're buying from a very small person that does a little happy dance when uh i see that i have an etsy sale (laughs) (laughs) that feeling is the best it really is. Um, I got a bunch of sales before I came upstate because I was doing like a little promotion. And I, I think I actually took a video of me dancing and put it on my business page. 
and I was like, this is what I do when you guys buy things. And it was funny because it, it was a genuine video. Like I didn't take it like, and then dance, like I was already dancing and I was like, I might as well just record this because <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds awesome. That's very sincere. And I'm glad you shared that because there is something about that, that people forget. Like when you're, you know, you can get lost in the sea of, you know, your feed. Right. And some profiles are just shells for big corporate sellers and others are, you know, small businesses like yours. Yeah. I think sometimes that's maybe what people forget when they're buying online, like shopping small versus shopping big is like, it's either shopping from like a corporation or from like a real person. Right. Do you have any parting words of advice for somebody who's looking to turn their passion into a business like you did? Honestly, just do it and always follow your gut. Like if something feels right, go for it. If something feels wrong, like don't do it. But if you want to, you know, turn your passion into something, I just say go for it because, you know, the worst thing that could happen is, you know, you fail. And even if you failed, you still tried. I would also contend you stand to learn something and maybe it's worth trying again. I mean, yeah, knows? exactly. Failure is kind of the best learning tool. I couldn't agree with that more. Sammy, thank you for taking the time to talk with me tonight. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. Anything else you want to add? No, I don't think so. Just uh, maybe that everyone enjoys the full moon that I'm looking at right now. <laughs> oh, man. See, that's the thing. You're not on the island. I I got to get outside and see if we can even see the sky tonight. I don't... Long Island. Well, you're all the way out on, uh, you're in Suffolk normally, right? You're out east? Yes. I'm uh, very out east. Oh, uh, see, yeah, I'm, in, I'm on like, I'm close to the Queens County border. So it's, it's a... Uh, yeah, we, we we're rolling the dice with the with the sky visibility, but I, I I hope it's not so bad that we couldn't see the moon. Um, anyway, thanks so much for talking to me. Yeah, no problem, dude. Thank you for having me. Of course, go enjoy the rest of your night. All right, go enjoy that full moon. <laughs> thanks. All right, talk later. I'll talk to you later. All right, bye. bye. Thank you, Sammy, for coming on the show, and thank you for listening. For show notes with links to Sammy's stuff, as well as some of the clips mentioned in the beginning of the episode, please go to deathbeforedeskjob.net, click Sammy's episode, and you'll find the stuff in those show notes. Uh, Sammy's information, if you want to see her on Instagram, the handle is crystal underscore garden underscore creations. And if you want to see her on Etsy, etsy.com slash shop slash crystal garden C. You know, it's, it's beautiful, spiritual or not. I really love it. And uh, if she wasn't on vacation in Calicoon Center, I would order from her now. But I'm going to let her take her time. What's my big takeaway? Um, grief, I guess. It's a cruel mistress. And uh, not to sound cliche here, but in the darkness comes the light, right? So I know that her and I had a similar experience losing our best friend at a young age. And... Um, you know, in that process of recovery, there is an opportunity to grow. So grieve, wallow, do what you have to do. But once you're done, dust yourself off, pick yourself up and make something beautiful for the world because the world deserves it. Stay safe until next time. Take care.